Hello, welcome to this talk on the radiology of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. My name is Dr. Richard Sawyer. I'm a radiologist who used to work at Withenshaw Hospital. This is a national aspergillus centre, so we have had extensive experience of the various different manifestations of aspergillosis, and I hope to share some of that experience with you. The main objectives I have is to help you be familiar with the different radiological patterns of CPA, how to optimally diagnose and also to follow up aspergillosis because it's surprisingly difficult to see whether you're making progress, partly because it's a much more chronic condition than many that we deal with. The final thing I want to try and touch on a little bit is how to distinguish between CPA and other diseases that may mimic it. I'm going to be touching on both third world issues. I spent some time in Uganda and have also helped with some of the research studies that we've done looking at chronic pulmonary aspergillosis there. But I'm also hoping to show some of the use of CT, which is particularly powerful in trying to diagnose pleural thickening, cavities, and can also be used in treatment. The important thing to recognise with CPA is that this occurs in non-immunocompromised patients. This is quite different to the invasive aspergillosis that you see in patients who are on chemotherapy. The commonest sort is chronic cavitary pulmonary aspergillosis, but I'm also going to be looking at aspergillus nodules, the simple aspergilloma and dealing with the nomenclature of that and the less common but quite important because of its effect on patients the chronic fibrosing pulmonary aspergillosis. Now although I've said that CPA doesn't tend to attack people who are immunocompromised it does use the damage that has been done by other diseases so typically there's a cavity most commonly probably worldwide is tuberculous, but also non-tuberculous mycobacteria, and then other things such as ABPA, people with sarcoid, and other late fibrotic conditions. We've seen it in a range of things like after um, pneumothorax treatment and after thoracic surgery. Basically, although you, the patients are not immunocompromised, they are compromised by having some damage, which allows the aspergillus infection to take hold. I'm keen to point out that it's an aspergillus infection. It's, it's not a colonization. It's not a, a symbiotic relationship. Aspergillus is, is growing malevolently in these people's lungs. So don't use the word colonized if you can. It's common for patients to have more than one lung disease and bronchiectasis is quite common. Unfortunately, some people with CPA have got no known underlying disease. They may have some unusual disease which we're just not aware of, and it's very common for people to be treated empirically for TB. This is a very important lesson because if you've had somebody who's had TB and then they seem to get bad again, people will typically try antibiotics a second time. And if they don't respond, then the patient may well be labelled as a multi-resistant TB case. This is shown by our work in Uganda often to be misleading. And you should really check the immunology of the patient to see if they've got any suggestion of, of aspergillus. As well as being a radiologist, I'm also a gardener. And I'm very aware, looking in woodland settings, of aspergillus as a very effective way of recycling trees and other gardening materials. Aspergillus does the same job inside our lung tissues as it does in the woodland floor, destroying tissues, breaking them down, and in the patient it can result in fibrosis or enlargement of the cavities that it's infected. This can go on to give you the destroyed lung syndrome that is a synonym for chronic fibrosing pulmonary aspergillosis. I'll talk a little bit more later on with CT scans, but typically the infection grows inside the lining of the fun fungal cavity, and then this tissue can then collapse and form a, a fungal ball. I want to emphasize that we want to try and diagnose 
chronic pulmonary aspergillosis before we get an aspergilloma because this is a late feature and if you're limited to chest x-rays or conventional tomography you're going to be handicapped by not being able to pick up these aspergillomas or appreciate the cavities until much later. It's also quite common because the cavities are usually in communication with the bronchial tree to get secondary bacterial infection. One of the slightly unusual features of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis is the angioneogenesis that you get, probably due to a degree of hypoxia in the tissues around the fungus. This causes new vessels and these can arise both from the systemic circulation, typically branches of the subclavian artery, as well as from the, the more classical bronchial arteries. Either way, the blood vessels are at systemic pressure and if hemoptysis happens, it can be really quite serious. The disease itself is quite serious. Both the morbidity and mortality is still high, even if we treat, but clearly without treatment, it's usually higher still. I'd like to start off by talking about the disease that perhaps most radiologists are familiar with, which is aspergilloma formation. An aspergilloma is one of the non-invasive forms of aspergillus, and it's a, a growth in the pre-existing cavity, as I've said, typically tuberculous or sometimes just in a, a widely dilated area of bronchial tree. And we most commonly see them in the posterior segments of the upper lobes and the apical segments of the lower lobes. Because the cavity is, is distant from the host immune system, even though the person is not immune deficient, the aspergillus can grow essentially separate from that and it then causes vascular granulation tissue and one of the very characteristic features of aspergillosis, chronic aspergillosis, is a local pleural reaction. If you don't see this, then it's worth thinking twice about whether you've got the right diagnosis. If you look microscopically, as well as the hyphae from the fungus, you'll also see um, a biofilm, a glycocalyx, uh, a mixture of fibrin and mucus. Radiologically, the hallmark on chest x-ray or CT is a mobile mass within the cavity. We don't nowadays tend to roll the patient, certainly on CT it's not usually necessary and occasionally the cavity can be completely filled in but usually you can see a small crescent or a suggestion that there's a something filling a larger space. On chest x-ray it's not as easy to appreciate this Calcification isn't a feature I particularly look at and uh, isn't commonly seen. Quite a lot of patients are asymptomatic, but it's common to see hemoptysis and if you have erosion of a bronchial artery or one of the uh, subclavian branches, you can get life-threatening hemoptysis. A lot of patients have got cough, a productive sputum, and sometimes weight loss, just generally feeling unwell. The weight loss can be a useful symptom in follow-up and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Here then is a classical example of a patient with a simple aspergilloma. The patient, again, fairly typically presenting with hemoptysis but nothing else. And in this particular case, there was no suggestion of a cause for a pre-existing cavity. But many patients have small bully up at the apices and this may be where this has arisen. The patient was otherwise healthy and they had aspergillus antibodies in the blood. So let's have a look at what we can see. There's a slightly irregular thick walled cavity. You can see medially against the mediastinum there's a local pleural thickening and also laterally up against the rib. This is very typical of aspergillus disease, chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. Within the cavity, you can appreciate that the fungal ball is not a, a smooth, rounded ball. And this is what you'd expect if it's made from the collapse of the wall of the cavity, sort of coagulating into a, an irregular lump. When we do a CT scan, we look carefully for abnormal blood vessels. So although a high-resolution scan can pick up a 
an aspidulous ball, fungal ball, the use of contrast is really quite helpful in uh, advising surgeons that there may be a very large systemic vessel. Here's another example of an aspergilloma. This patient's fungal ball is sitting apparently centrally within the cavity and this happens probably because of, of adherence, failure of collapse of the the cavity wall and this holds the fungal ball more centrally within the in the space. The air crescent is quite clearly seen on the lung windows and on the mediastinal windows which show the blood vessels very clearly, very strong enhancement which you want not just in pulmonary phase but in the systemic arterial phase. You can appreciate that there's no visible blood vessel there is a suggestion posteriorly of a slight meniscus of fluid and it's quite common to have a little bit of fluid dependent inside the cavity. I said before it's often harder to appreciate development of an aspergilloma with just plain radiography and here's an example which perhaps shows that a little. This is a patient whose aspergilloma has evolved between 2006 and 2009. This patient needed intensive care and this was due to a community acquired pneumonia but you can appreciate there is a, a cavity in the right upper zone. By May the patient presented with a new cough and I think you can make out a, an area of rather ill-defined shadowing immediately within that cavity. Because we were able to do a CT scan and I'd recommend if you've got access to it to do that in these sort of cases because you can appreciate a reasonably smoothly demarcated nodule of, of aspergillus sitting within the cavity. The patient also had an aspergillus antibody test which was positive and had a successful lobectomy which in this sort of case is curative but of course you want to be sure that there isn't any disease elsewhere in the chest. Here's another example of an aspergilloma. In this case, the fungal ball is quite smoothly demarcated and the meniscus wouldn't be as easy to pick up because there's quite a lot of adjacent cicatricial deformation with bronchiectasis and again, CT is the best way of showing this. Here are some examples of aspergillomas on plain radiography. In this patient in February 2004 there was just a little bit of patchy shadowing but I think you can make out the, the slight cavity formation at the right apex. By April of the same year there's increase in pleural thickening just adjacent to the uh, clavicle and lateral to the aspergilloma and you can see the early part of the, the crescent Within three months, that crescent is really very obvious, and you can see the fungal ball sitting within this uh, aspergilloma cavity. There's also, rather worryingly, uh, evidence of a new cavity formation medially. So this is somebody with progressive cavitary aspergillosis. In a patient with sarcoidosis, it's very common to have quite extensive changes within the lung. And in that situation, seeing an aspergilloma developing is very helpful in confirming chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. There is something even before the fungal ball develops within the cavity that's quite useful, and that's a slightly shaggy appearance of the cavitary wall. It, it looks different from a cavitating tumour or an area of tuberculosis, but it's quite hard to put your finger on exactly what's happening. The other thing that's very helpful is, as I've already said, the development of pleural disease. Some more examples of aspergillomas may help. In the first illustration you can see that this would be quite hard to pick out on a chest x-ray. The fungal ball lying more laterally and the, the crescent certainly wouldn't be easy to appreciate with a more medial position. Letter B the middle illustration shows quite severe bronchiectasis and it's likely that this aspergilloma has developed inside one of these cavities. The cavities in the in the centre of the, the lung are not particularly thick or shaggy and so these aren't worrying for aspergillus infection at the moment. In the final uh, image here in the 
letter C, you can see that the cavity has an irregular wall, particularly laterally against the pleural thickening. And that's the sort of appearance that I'm suggesting to you can be very, very helpful in indicating an aspergillus infection. The other thing to notice here is that the actual fungal ball isn't particularly dense. It's, it's in the process of, of forming as the, as the wall sheds and falls into the central part of the cavity. I hinted before that tumours form things that can look very similar to chronic pulmonary aspergillosis and it's very important to be aware of this differential diagnosis. Here's a patient whose lungs appear otherwise quite well preserved but there is a cavity and there's a soft tissue area which looks slightly more adherent. It's, it's lying medially, it, it's not fallen posteriorly. But then we've seen cases where aspergillus fungal balls has, has lodged like this. In this case, the PET scan was positive and a biopsy pro proved that it was squamous cell carcinoma. But it's important to be aware of that differential diagnosis. We've also seen this the other way around where people strongly suspected recurrent disease after surgery and it turned out to be aspergillus infecting the cavity. One of the things that can happen to aspergillomas is that the patient can spontaneously improve and these two images from a chest x-ray series from March to September 2015 show exactly this happening. So in March you can see a classical crescent around a fungal ball and then after a few days of heavy coughing with brownie material you can see that the cavity is now apparently clear. This improvement doesn't mean that the patient is cured. There's still a cavity infected with uh, aspergillus, any neovascularization will still be there and the patient should ideally have a CT scan and if necessary an angiogram to check this out a bit further. One thing I do want to share with you is that there's a significant difference between a mycetoma and an aspergilloma. You'll hear me talk about fungal balls, that's unambiguous, aspergillus balls, but a mycetoma was one of the terms that radiologists used to use routinely for an aspergilloma and it's not, an, it's not the same thing at all. What we now mean by a mycetoma is an infection of the skin and subcutaneous tissue caused by usually a mixture of fungi and some slightly odd bacteria. So this is what a mycetoma is. It's a tumorous sort of growth of fungal stuff in the, in the foot most commonly, but in other parts of the body as well. So not the right term for an aspergilloma or a fungal ball in the chest. I'd like now to talk about chronic cavitary pulmonary aspergillosis. I've already said this is the commonest form of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis and typically the, the cavities, the ones I've shown you before with a, 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 an aspergilloma lying in, are actually more destructive and uh, damage the rest of the lung. Here's a chest x-ray showing already quite a lot of fibrosis and cavitation on, on the left because the heart and the mediastinum are pulled across to the left and you've got the resultant compensatory hyperinflation. So this is a patient with chronic cavitary aspergillosis. Here's another patient. You can see here that there's a cavity but there's no fungal ball inside this. We've used contrast here. This again is in the same way as aspergillomas can have this neovascularization, so can chronic cavitary aspergillosis. So important, give contrast, look carefully at the chest wall and, and trace out where the bronchial vessels are going. This was a, a sad case. The person was perfectly fit working as a gardener and moved a large volume of rather mouldy bark and inhaled a very large inoculum of fungal spores which attacked the, the chest in this way. So to go from a, a normal lung, as far as we know, to this, just because you've shifted a pile of bark is very sad. I've mentioned about the rather irregular appearance of the cavity and this patient with chronic cavitary aspergillosis shows a good example of this 
very very irregular lining of the of the cavity it, it looks more like a, a map or appearance of uh, peninsulas going out into a lake or the sea um, and this is a, a, a fairly typical appearance there's, there's a lot of tissue growing inside this this cavity metabolically this is typically active and if there's a question about malignancy a pets a positive pet scan does not answer the question you can see on the right on the coronal image of the PET scan there's a lot of metabolic activity up at that apex so this is a good example showing that you can't use PET to distinguish between aspergillus and it, and tumor one thing in chronic cavity pulmonary aspergillosis is that the findings need to be persistent for several months this is a, a patient who has had bully probably for many years you can see up at the right apex quite extensive bullous formation and in September 2016 these became opaque you can see that there are fluid levels but I would suggest to you that the certainly in the middle row on the left there's no suggestion of that thick rather shaggy wall of the cavity that I, I think is quite a useful sign and by December of that year these are all cleared slightly different level but the cavity had cleared so this is an infection probably bacterial and this is not chronic cavity pulmonary aspergillosis this is a repeat of the earlier slide just to emphasize the point I was making about the irregular cavity but also to say that the fungal ball lying posteriorly here has has started to form but hasn't actually solidified it's just debris which has fallen off the edge of the cavity I said that it was helpful using CT and sometimes chest x-ray to follow up patients and this is a a good example of a patient who's got a thick wall, slightly irregular cavity, quite a lot of pleural thickening at the right apex in the first image. And then after treatment, you can see that the, the cavity is at a slightly different level. I'm sorry about that, but the cavity is thin walled. And, and when you see this, that's a good response to treatment. In the last image, you can see a, an area though which has got the rather thicker walls. Here it's more smooth this isn't the classical shaggy wall that I was talking about before the other thing which is slightly atypical here is that there isn't marked local pleural thickening so this would make you think I'm not quite sure whether this is chronic pulmonary aspergillosis and you might be more reliant then on the serology if the patient deteriorates then it may not be so important to have CT scanning and here's an example where a chest x-ray series can show you where you've got failure of treatment in April 2004 you can see that infralateral to a classical aspergilloma with a, a cavity and an air crescent you've got a little bit of shadowing but by July of the same year you've actually got development of cavities in in that area of presumed infection this was despite having three months of itraconazole. I'd like now to talk about the end stage of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, which is the chronic fibrosing pulmonary aspergillosis. So often it's an end result after you've not treated or failed to treat a chronic cavitary disease. There's often very extensive fibrosis and typically we see destruction of at least a couple of lobes of the lung, sometimes the whole lung, and this results in a, a major loss of lung function. Quite often the fibrosis appears solid on the chest x-ray, but if you do a CT scan you can appreciate the fibrosis and often small cavities within it. To make the diagnosis, as opposed to any other chronic severe fibrosing process, you do need either serology or some actual direct evidence of microbiological fungal disease within the lung. It's quite helpful on the CT scan to look carefully for aspergillomas because if you see these then that is really very helpful in making the diagnosis. The synonym for this late stage process is, is called destroyed lung. Here then is a patient whose chronic cavitary disease you can see in June 99 there's a, a big cavity at the left apex there's a little bit of shift of the mediastinum to the left and 
by July 2001, the amount of fungal growth in that cavity has increased, but the, most of the rest of the lung, it's not entirely normal, but the, the left base is certainly aerated. But by 2003, without any treatment, that left lung is completely destroyed. Clearly, you'd want to be sure that there wasn't a, a plug or something blocking the left lower lobe bronchus, but in this case it, it was indeed widespread aspergillus disease in the, the chest with a lot of fibrosis. You can still make out a, a small cavity at the left apex. Here's a different chest x-ray series showing the same sort of process. See in 1992 that there's again left apical disease, a little bit of a shift of the heart and mediastinum. By the follow-up film, without any treatment in 94, there's more disease at the left base. You can't easily see behind the heart. You can't see the hemidiaphragm, which is good, good and important place to look. And then by 97, still without any treatment, that left lung is essentially destroyed. A lot of pleural thickening. Still some cavitary change at the left apex. And on CT, you'd be looking again for aspergillomas. And on serology, you'd be looking for evidence of aspergillus infection. Any airspace that's able to get infected is vulnerable to chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. And this is a patient who'd had a, a talc pleurodesis for spontaneous pneumothorax. And I'm not quite clear how the aspergillus got into the cavity, but sometimes there can be a, an air communication in some way. But either way, there was a talc pleurodesis and then there was a, a lot of fibrosis and contraction in that right chest. You can see that arising between 2012 and 2013, getting much worse by 2014 with a lot of pleural disease. And by 2016, the heart and mediastinum is shifted. The trachea, you can see, way across to the right. And this patient had got very high aspergillus antibodies. So even though there was no aspergilloma visible on the CT scan, this is chronic fibrosing pulmonary aspergillosis. I said before that the CT scan is very helpful and it's particularly important to be sure that there isn't a plug. If you know there's aspergillus around, you, you would worry about a, a very viscid plug that's not easy to shift in the, the bronchial tree. And the CT scan here shows importantly that there's not just no plug, but there's really severe bronchiectasis in that right lung. I think the other alarming thing here is the amount of infection affecting the left chest, peripheral pleural thickening and adjacent fibrosis. So the CT scan can be can be very helpful in these situations. I mentioned before that to make the diagnosis of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis you need to see changes which are more than three months. But sometimes you get more rapid change. This is a patient who's got chronic cavitary pulmonary aspergillosis which has very rapidly progressed. Slightly unusual organism, but in November 2008, the left chest looks fine. Uh, I'll show you a CT scan in a moment. But on the right, you can see that there's an apical cavity, quite marked pleural change. And by December, that left chest has completely gone. Here's the CT scan. And again, this rather irregular cavitary wall is, is completely typical there's possibly a small developing area of aspergilloma lying medially. Again, at this, this time the left chest is fine. Let's look now at the slightly more unusual appearances of aspergillus nodules. So remember these are people who are not immunosuppressed but have got a, an area of, of soft tissue, typically rather spiculated, and in most of these patients, there's been smoking history or some other reason why tumour is suspected. And we've seen a good few number of cases where the patient has had a resection without people being aware that this is an aspergillus nodule. In this case, there was fibrosis, there was granulation tissue, but there were fungal hyphae within the lesion. Remember, PET scanning can be positive. And it's important, if we can, to try and treat these patients medically, although sometimes su surgery may be the right approach in completely resecting a, a lesion. 
This is a patient who had a PET scan. It's not grossly avid, but it's still increased avidity at the left apex. The nodule is perhaps not classical for a tumour, but with the lung cancer screening that we're doing, we're seeing a whole range of different morphologies of, of tumours. So very much in the differential diagnosis. But the patient had got an IgG antibody against aspergillus. That doesn't mean that this lesion is definitely a, an aspergillus nodule, but at least it suggests and makes it very important to biopsy these lesions if we can. If you have multiple nodules, as in this patient, you can make a suggestion that this is perhaps less likely to be multifocal cancer. And we often have a debate in the lung cancer MDT about how many lesions do we have to biopsy and show that it's aspergillus disease before we relax about the other lesions. In this case, there were some pointers to suggest that this was not malignancy. One of the lesions had got a more typical aspergilloma with a, an area of air crescent, in this case lying medially, and there was also a suggestion of, of possibly previous ABPA or some other cause of bronchiectasis um, resulting in bronchiectasis in the middle lobe. not going to talk any more about biopsy of nodules but clearly if you are biopsying an aspergillus nodule and there is near vascularization then hemorrhage might be more of a problem and uh, certainly it's worth being aware of. I'd like to talk a little bit more about hemoptysis because although it might be trivial and lead to the diagnosis because you're investigating somebody who's otherwise well it can also result in massive hemorrhage Remember, these are near vascularization of systemic blood vessels, either branches of the subclavian or the bronchial artery. And although common causes are, include cancer, bronchiectasis, TB, and even AV malformations, sometimes you don't actually find a cause for hemoptysis. So clearly in this talk, I'm focusing on aspergillosis. And because of CT scanning done in the conventional way now with multi-detectors and spiral reformations, we're able to pick up aspergillomas, which can be very helpful in, in indicating the cause. It's important in my view that we do CT scanning before we do bronchoscopy, uh, trying to guide the bronchoscopists. Um, quite often the distal airways are out of reach of the, of the bronchoscope, um, but we can still suggest lavage or, or brushings of those areas. The important thing that angiography with by giving contrast with the CT scan means that we can actually tell the vascular radiologists roughly where to go to look for embolization of these vessels. And bronchial, bronchial artery angiography prior to embolization is the gold standard for showing where this vessel is from. Very, very important to be aware that often almost 50% of patients, there are multiple blood vessels, so it's vital that we check m all of the adjacent vessels. The good news about embolization is that in the vast majority of patients, we're able to achieve control of the hemorrhage, so more than 90%. The slightly less good news is that there's a significant re-bleed rate, almost a third of patients at three years, and quite a few patients have got uh, some have got repeat hemorrhage within the year. We think that effective medical treatment, antifungal therapy, is probably useful in reducing the bleeding. And on this image, you can appreciate the very abnormal blood vessels. You can see a serpentine large caliber vessel and this smudge of tiny capillaries in the wall of a cavity around a, an area of aspergillus. Here's an example of a patient who'd had two vessels involved. In this particular pair of images, you can see the abnormal vessels coming off the internal mammary, the sort of smudge of, of, light, of dark gray just lying lateral to the internal mammary. And then the radiologist put a coil in just so there wasn't any inadvertent spread of the embolic material down into the celiac axis. In this patient, 
the lateral thoracic artery was also involved and you can see not quite so marked a, a smudge of capillaries in the cavity but grossly abnormal blood quite large caliber blood vessels and again you can see the pre and post embolization images here this slide is of a relatively small study of 43 patients all of whom have had mycobacterial avium complex disease but some had had chronic pulmonary aspergillosis most of whom hadn't been additionally treated the left hand side of the graph is after the bronchial artery embolization and you can see the people with the uh, mycobacterial only infection still had relapses but the people who weren't being additionally treated uh, did significantly worse and uh, you can see that uh, only 40% of them had not had a, re a recurrence by 20 months. So then in conclusion I hope I've shared with you several of the different forms of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis and shown how we're able to either alert the clinician to the diagnosis and I have a personal view that people who are being investigated should have routine serology because this is a helpful pointer and an indication that aspergillus might be the cause of myriad possible changes in the lung. The ability of chronic cavitary and chronic fibrosing pulmonary aspergillosis to mimic TB is really important especially in the third world and you must have a high index of suspicion that you're dealing with an infection with another organism rather than a development of a multi-drug resistant tuberculous organism. We've looked a little bit at malignancy but it, I'm sure you will see over the next few years quite a few examples of aspergillus nodules that have mimicked malignancy and even PET scanning won't distinguish between the two so biopsy is important. If you can try and diagnose chronic pulmonary aspergillosis before you develop aspergillomas because the degree of neovascularization and hemorrhage is probably going to be less by that stage and I've talked a little bit about the rather irregular cavitation that you can see but also the pleural thickening and these pericavitary infiltrates. Although chest x-rays are quite good if you've got access to CT that's really helpful not just for the diagnosis where you might pick up small aspergillomas in an area of otherwise solid lung but also in following up the response to treatment because it's quite difficult to, to see whether patients are getting better sometimes you just have to say do you feel better are you eating uh, is your weight uh, increasing uh, and that may be helpful finally bronchial artery embolization is a really important tool in, in treating these patients it may be life-saving but warn the patients that they may well get recurrence uh, but we think treating them medically is going to help reduce the amount of recurrence. Thank you very much. Please also consider watching if you haven't already some of our other talks about aspergillus infection, ABPA and also other diseases. Thanks again.